you, uh, you did mention Jesus towards the end of your, end of your talk, but uh, doesn't the theory of evolution with its uh, death and destruction before Adam's fall, doesn't that destroy the gospel and undermine the gospel itself? Because uh, if there's death and destruction before Adam, then why did Christ come? See, I, I believe evolution is a nonsense. Well, it's a nonsense. So do I. I mean, uh, uh, if you look at our website, you'll see that our position is that God performs millions of creation miracles, and each one is an instantaneous event. For example, the origin of life we now realize happened uh, in an instantaneous moment of time, and actually happened without the benefit of any building blocks. Therefore, it must be a supernatural uh, event. But concerning your specific question, the most specific text is Romans 5, 12 through 19. And what you see in Romans 5, 12 is that when Adam sinned against God in the Garden of Eden, death through sin was visited upon all men. Now notice here Paul is making two very careful qualifications because in the book of Romans, he's talking about four different kinds of death. And he says, this is a death you get through sin. Well, of all the species of life that God created, only humans sin. The dogs don't sin. The cows don't sin. Only humans sin. So he's saying, this is humanity. Then to make sure you get the point, he says, death to all men. It doesn't say death to all life. It says death to all men. And so Adam's offense brought death to the human species. And if you read all the way through to the 19th verse, what you'll see is that the moment that Adam sinned, he died instantly, spiritually. But he didn't die physically. That came later. God sent two angels to block access to the tree of life. So what's interesting there is humanity had the potential to live forever in a spiritually dead state. But God's intent was to use physical death as a tool to deliver us from the far worse consequence of spiritual death. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that there was no death of plants and animals before Adam's sin. The Bible is silent on that issue. Well, almost. Psalm 104 does address this. What you see in Psalm 104 is a message of God packing our planet with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, and as long as the laws of physics will permit, why? So that God could create us human beings at the very end and we would be the beneficiaries of all the biodeposits provided by all the animal and plant life that preceded us. And if you get this book, Navigating Genesis, we actually total up the minimum quantity of biodeposit resources in the crust of the earth. It's at least 76 quadrillion tons. And here's the context in Psalm 104, verses 25 and following. It's the property of all life to die off. That happens just because of thermodynamics. I mean, look around you. All of us are in a state of death because of thermodynamics. Look at my face. You'll see that I'm thermodynamically decayed considerably. Uh, and Romans 8 says the whole universe was subject to the law of decay. Everything decays. And because of that, it's a property of all life to die off. That's verse 25, verse 26 and 27. Uh, God recreates and renews the face of the earth. And it's a process of recreation and renewal that builds up all the biodeposits that allows us to have coal, oil, natural gas, steel, uh, zinc. I mean, all the metals that we mine to build our cities were concentrated by life that predated us. So we thank God for the sulfate-reducing bacteria when we say grace at our dinner table. Well, not every time, but once in a while uh, we do that. But a good question, and by the way, it's addressed in more detail in this book. Oops. Yes. Hi, Dr. Ross. Um, uh, different type of question. Um, I, I know that uh, your colleague uh, Ken Samples is a, is a Calvinist. Uh, I'd like to hear your take on the whole predestination versus uh, free will thing. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, reasons to believe is not Hugh Ross. It's a team of scholars. And uh, you know, w we all agree and sign a doctrinal statement that's basically consistent with the longer creeds of the church. I think the creedal statements are outstanding. 
and so we insist that all of us sign that every year. However, we permit diversity in what we consider to be the non-essentials, uh, like end times and uh, like this whole issue of free will and predestination. Nevertheless, I decided to take the initiative to write a book on the topic. And my motivation for writing the book was recognizing that in surveys we did in the Los Angeles area, 15% of people who identified themselves as non-Christians and said they couldn't consider becoming a Christian said so because of the apparent contradiction between human free will and divine predestination. So for the benefit of those 15%, I decided to write this book called Beyond the Cosmos. It's not at the back book table, but you can get it from reasons.org or through Amazon. But what I do in that book is first of all lay out the latest science that tells us this universe in which we live is not constrained by just length, width, and height. There are in fact nine dimensions of space, three big ones and six little ones. And through the space-time theorems, we know there has to be at least the equivalent of a second dimension of time. And so what I do in the book is show you if you've got two dimensions of time and nine dimensions of space, you can have human free will operating completely and divine predestination simultaneously without contradiction. But I also show you in the book why it's impossible to reconcile predestination and free will if you're trying to do it within the context of length, width, height, and time. And by the way, in the Netherlands and Belgium, they actually fought a war. There was Arminians fighting against Calvinists, and they actually shed blood over this issue. Needless, because there's eight passages in the Bible that state that God predetermines every word, thought, and action that any human being has ever expressed from before the creation of the universe, and yet God holds us responsible for all of the decisions and actions and thoughts that we experience. There are eight passages in the Bible that state both in the same verse. So the Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible certainly did not see these as contradictions. But you've got Arminians thinking the Calvinists are dead wrong and Calvinists who think the Arminians are dead wrong. And if I could speak for Ken Samples of benefit, he is not a hyper-Calvinist. Uh, he realizes that people take uh, Calvin to a great extreme, uh, so he fully endorses the book that I wrote and the fact that we human beings are free will beings and therefore we're responsible before God uh, to uh, come to grips with his offer and to use our will to receive his offer. A hyper-Calvinist basically say we don't have to do evangelism because God's already determined who's going to be saved. There's nothing we have to do. Uh, that's an abuse of the Calvinist position. It's abuse of predestination. By the way, we also have a short DVD of the, called Beyond the Cosmos. So if you don't want to read the book, you can uh, get the DVD. Uh, Hugh, I got a um, question in regards to evolution. Um, I think I heard through your app, you said that your research can show that there was no primordial soup yes. to begin the evolution process. Yes. I wonder if you could expand on that. Well, this is something I'm hoping Christians will take advantage of, is that we now have the scientific evidence that the origin of life happened on planet Earth in a geologic instant without the benefit of any prebiotic soup or prebiotic molecules. And the reason why we know that's the case is that you have every organism, every plant and animal, every bacterium has certain isotope identities. For example, all organisms prefer carbon-12 over carbon-13. They prefer nitrogen-14 over nitrogen-15 and sulfur-32 over sulfur-34. So we look at those isotopes to see if the ancient carbonaceous material in the crust of the Earth was prebiotic or postbiotic. We find the postbiotic, there is no prebiotic. Nowhere on the Earth do we see the signal of prebiotic molecules. And it was a Romanian physicist who explained why. He says if you have oxygen, it stops the prebiotic chemistry. I mean, that famous experiment where they put chemicals inside a flask and put a spark through it, they made sure there wasn't the tiniest amount of oxygen in the flask. They knew that would stop the whole uh, process. And what this Romanian physicist said, if you've got oxygen, 
it eliminates the possibility of these prebiotics. But if you don't have oxygen, there's no ozone. And without the ozone, there's nothing to stop ultraviolet radiation streaming in from the sun. And at the time of the origin of life, that ultraviolet radiation was thousands of times more intense than it is today. But even today's level of intensity, if it wasn't blocked out by ozone, would stop prebiotic chemistry. So that's what's called the oxygen ultraviolet paradox. If you got oxygen, it can't happen. If you don't have oxygen, it can't happen. Either way, you lose. And by the way, that applies to the entire solar system. So that explains why people are speculating that life came from another planetary system. Uh, but there was uh, an Australian origin of life researcher that calculated how frequently Earth gets a rock from another planetary system uh, once every 10 to the 16 years, uh, which is a million times older than the age of the universe. So it takes an extraterrestrial alien to bring life to planet Earth, but it's not an alien from another planet. It's a being from beyond space, time, matter, and energy that brought life here to planet Earth. If you want to dig into it in more detail, we've actually written a book, Buzz Ron and I, on origins of life. And by the way, that book got peer-reviewed by an atheist origin of life researcher in the journal Origins of Life and the Biosphere. And I'll tell you what he said about the book. He said, of all the books I've seen in the origin of life, this is the most scientifically comprehensive, the most up-to-date, and the most accurate, and the most fairly balanced. I like everything about the book except the Jesus Christ part. Um, can you just uh, uh, address uh, like pre-Adam and Eve um, humanoid fossil record? Like, uh, how, how do you see that? Well, okay, God is responsible for every life form that exists on the surface of the earth, past and present. And the message you get in Psalm 104 is every life form that God has ever created serves a purpose in equipping human beings to launch and sustain civilization and take the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ to all the people and groups of the world. That includes the bipedal primates that preceded us. So for example, I made the point that Africa, where you got 12 different species of bipedal primates that precede human beings, the extinction rate when humans arrived in Africa of large-bodied bird and mammal species was only 4.5% and therefore people that were able to launch civilization. Contrasted with Australia, the extinction rate in Australia was 94%. And with that high of an extinction rate, the Aborigines were not able to launch themselves out of the Stone Age. It took Europeans coming with the animals that they had killed off to make it all happen. I mean, the sheep here in Australia are not indigenous. They were brought from uh, Europe and Asia. And so in that sense, uh, even Neanderthal and Homo erectus, the Australopithecines, serve a role in preparing the way for human beings and human civilization. They also provide a powerful proof against Darwinian evolution. Thanks to conservation biology, we now have experiments that show us that if a mammal has an adult body size greater than, seven kilo than three kilograms, it goes extinct before it can evolve. And of course, all the bipedal primates are bigger than those three kilograms. And we see in these creatures where we got DNA, Neanderthals, for example, we got DNA from 20 different species. They were here for a 100,000 year period before human beings show up. During that 100,000 years, we can't measure any change in the DNA. It doesn't evolve. And likewise, the earliest Neanderthals look the same as the latest. We don't see any evolution. And even more dramatically, Homo erectus, which was here from 2 million years ago to 200,000 years ago, the DNA is too corrupted to be analyzed. When we look at the skeletons, they're the same 2 million years ago as they were 200,000 years ago. Primates don't evolve. They're here for a period of time, they go extinct, and they're replaced. Again, Psalm 104, it's a property of all life to go extinct, but God recreates and renews the face of the earth. 
And the bigger the animal and the more advanced the animal, the faster it goes extinct. What we see with the bipedal primates, the average extinction time is one to 200,000 years. By the way, that's also going to apply to us. Uh, we need to fulfill the Great Commission quickly because if we don't, we'll be extinct. Hi, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, I just had a quick question about, um, you mentioned how the moon, um, how, how a Mars-sized planet hid the Earth and created the moon, so on and so forth. So y you say that also that scientific, like the actual probability of that happening is very slim. Um, so I just wanted to know, where does God fit in that picture? Okay, very good. <coughs> in fact, I just wrote an article on our website a couple of months ago on the moon forming event. And this is something that my peers have been researching now for over 30 years. And the core of the story is that you really can't get a big moon orbiting a small planet close to its star unless you've got a really exotic collision event. And it's such that uh, when God formed the solar system, we had two planets sharing the orbit of the Earth. So, and that can actually happen. If you've got a planet 60 degrees back or forward, it's stable. So you can actually have two planets sharing the same orbit if they're exactly 60 degrees back or forward. However, it's only stable if it's a three-body situation where you've got a star and two planets. In our solar system, you've got Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. They destabilize uh, the orbit of the smaller the two planets which causes the smaller the two planets to very slowly creep towards the Earth and collide with the Earth at a low velocity into a very deep ocean. Evaporated the water, which caused 99% of our atmosphere to be dissipated into interplanetary space, and we lost 99.6% of our water, which enables us to have advanced life here. Now, in the last year, lunar formation theorists have been recognizing that it's more complicated than what they thought. And so they come up with a new set of models, which either require enormous fine-tuning of the mixing of the interior layers of the collider and the Earth in order to get the chemicals that are crucial to sustain plate tectonics, set up a strong magnetic field, and give us all the metal resources we need to launch advanced civilization. The end result is one of them published a paper in the British Journal of Nature a few months back when he said all this complication and all this incredible fine-tuning design is leading to philosophical disquiet amongst our mids. In other words, in their attempt to find a way to get less design, but instead they found there was even more design. And what's that philosophical disquiet? It looks like we're going to have to invoke a supernatural being to explain why the moon is exactly the way it is and the earth is exactly the way it is. And the philosophical disquiet is growing even in the past few weeks. Uh, just, just back again on uh, evolution. Uh, the, the mechanism by which evolution is supposed to have happened is by mutation and natural selection. Right. But um, isn't it true that mutations are only downhill? There are no beneficial mutations? How do you answer that question? Well, there's a ratio. I mean, most mutations are neutral, where they either do no harm or no good. But that doesn't help the Darwinian model, because it doesn't do anything. Uh, but if you look at the ratio of what are called harmful mutations to beneficial mutations, at best it's 10,000 to 1. At the other extreme, it's 10 million to 1. So you're going to get 10,000 minimum harmful mutations for every beneficial mutation. Now what that implies is, in order for a species to have any significant evolutionary change, it has to have an enormous population, have very short generation time, uh, and, um, you know, a very small body size. Bottom line is, the only species of life that have any hope 
uh, of Darwinian advance would be bacteria. All other species are off the table. And this is what's motivated some evolution of biologists to do what are called long-term evolution experiments. And there are three of these experiments I write about in my book, um, More Than a Theory. And the most famous one is one done at Michigan State University, where they took 12 populations of E. coli bacteria. And E. coli bacteria feed on sucrose. That's their food supply. But the scientists knew that inside the E. coli bacterium is machinery that would allow it to also feed on citrate. However, it lacks the pore structures to let the citrate through. But they also determined ahead of time that all you need is three mutations uh, in the pore structure for citrate to get through. And so what they did in the experiment is they supersaturated the E. coli bacteria with citrate and put in a starvation level of sucrose. And so they were basically doing everything they could externally to force the evolutionary change. And I say that because that would never happen in the world of nature. This is a laboratory experiment, but it's a good experiment because it shows the limitations of evolution. And what they're really trying to do is to see if uh, these populations would all evolve to feeding on citrate. Of the 12 populations, only one did, and only after 44,000 generations. So that's how long it took. Now, those 44,000 generations translate into a million years of human evolution. And all they got was three uh, mutations. Now, the real goal of the experiment, however, was to see if they could get evolution to repeat. And so they were expecting all 12 populations to develop this capability. To this day, the experiment is still ongoing. Uh, now they're up to over 65,000 generations they still have only one population that's feeding on the citrate. And then what was elegant about this experiment, every 500 generations, they took a sample from each of the 12 populations and put it into cold storage, which means after the 44,000th generation, they were able to go back to 43,500 and see if they could get that to come up with a citrate feeding. And that would work. But if they went back more than a few thousand generations, they could not get it to repeat. And so they published their paper basically saying Stephen Jay Gould got it right. Uh, that if you rewind the evolutionary clock, you never get the same outcome. It will not repeat. But what was catastrophic to the Darwinian model, we see thousands of examples in biology today and in biology past in the fossil record where you got repeated outcomes. All over the realm of biology, we have repeated design outcomes. And what this experiment proved is the Darwinian mechanism won't do it. Now, let me put a theological point on this. Remember I said earlier, for six days God creates, on the seventh day he doesn't create? The advantage of these long-term evolution experiments, theologically, we know God's not intervening. We're only going to get the natural process. Now, for the Darwinian model to be sustained, you've got to be able to demonstrate in the seventh day, you can explain what happens in the six days. And this experiment proves you can't. And by the way, that happened with the other two experiments as well. Uh, all we're seeing is the microevolution that takes place on day seven, not the macroevolution that is declared in the six days of creation. So that's an example of how scientists are actually putting to the test Darwin's claims and simultaneously confirming what the Bible has taught for thousands of years. And frankly, I'm hoping many more experiments like that will be run. Question here? Yep. Very simple question. <clears throat> wow, I didn't know I was so choked up. Um, can you, I, I've heard lots of new things tonight, very interesting to listen to. I'm not sure I'm going to research some bits myself as to what I'll believe about it. But if the planet crashed into the Earth, dissipating 97% or so of the water that was on the Earth, how did God then flood the Earth in Noah? It's oh. only a question. Okay, good question. And uh, in this book, uh, you'll see uh, five chapters on Noah's flood. So we go into it in detail. And by the way, there's some amazing new archaeological finds around the Persian Gulf that confirm what the Bible has taught for the first time. I mean, this stuff was just discovered a year ago, 
uh, by German archaeologists. So a little plug to, to get the book and get the latest insight on Noah's flood. Uh, but a lot of people read the Bible in the 21st century and think is teaching that the flood is global. What in fact is teaching is that the flood is worldwide. Now because we're global citizens, we think worldwide and global are one and the same. They're not. So one of the things I do in this book is actually take you through every passage in the Bible where it makes a claim of worldwide. And what you see every single time, it's less than the globe. And likewise, that's the case for the flood of uh, Genesis. So for example, it'll say that uh, all the kings and queens of the whole world uh, came to Solomon to hear of his great wisdom. But if you read two verses further on, it says they came from as far away as southern Arabia and Ethiopia. That was the whole world of uh, Solomon and his uh, nation. Or what Paul says in the New Testament to the Romans, your faith has been heard throughout the whole world. He meant the Roman world, not necessarily uh, the Aborigines living here in Australia. Likewise, when it says of the flood, 2 Peter 2, the world of the ungodly was flooded. And 2 Peter 3, cosmos tote, the world at the time the event took place. Now, what you notice in both cases, Peter is attaching an adjective to the word cosmos that immediately tells you it's not the whole globe. If he meant the whole globe, there would be no adjective. So wherever the ungodly dwelt, there was a flood. And so the real question as to how extensive was the flood, how extensive was humanity? Because what you see in uh, Genesis 7 and 8 is that all of humanity was wiped out and all the soulish animals that were associated with humanity. So in our model, there is no emperor penguins on board the ark. Humans had no contact with the emperor penguins, no need to kill them, and no need to put them on the ark. Uh, and this fits what you see in the Levitical law, uh, that when you sin in front of a cockroach, it does not change the behavior of a cockroach. They're not soulish, so they can't be impacted by our sinful behavior, unless, of course, you step on them. Uh, but the higher animals are impacted by our sin. So you may have heard of the mean dog syndrome. Mean dogs are owned by mean people. And it's not that the dog is sinful or immoral, the dog is simply trying to bring pleasure to its vicious owner. And so vicious dogs are always owned by vicious people. And that's why it tells us in the Levitical law that if a cow has a habit of goring other creatures, the owner is to be spoken to and told to redress the behavior. If the behavior continues, the cow is to be killed and the owner along with the cow. Making it clear the owner is responsible for that cow's behavior. So that's what the flood is all about in Genesis 7 and 8, uh, where God kills off all of humanity and all of the animals impacted by the sin of humanity, except for Noah, his family, and their animals. Uh, there was the ones that are saved. And how extensive was the flood? What we see is that God commands Adam and Eve, multiply and fill the earth, but they didn't do it. They refused to spread out over the face of the earth. God brings a flood, wipes out humanity, and he repeats the command to Noah, multiply and fill the earth. But if you read Genesis 9, the language is stronger than it is to uh, Adam and Eve. He's basically insisting that they multiply and fill the earth. Once again, we see in Genesis 11, they don't do it. They stay in one place. And therefore, God has to step in and forcibly scatter humanity into all the continents of the earth. Now, that's documented in Genesis 10, where it talks about the nations that God sets up and spreads and scatters. Notice that's after the flood, not before the flood. And now we have DNA evidence that tells us that humanity indeed was in one locale, and then there was a very brief period of extremely aggressive migration, and then the migration stopped. And we actually can use the DNA evidence to trace the migration routes, the date of the routes, and the speed with which humans migrated along those routes. The two primary routes are the south shore of Asia and the west shore of North and South America. And it all happened within a few hundred years. So the Bible declared it first in Genesis 10, 
we now have DNA evidence to prove that what's in Genesis 10 indeed is accurate. Uh, probably not necessary now because uh, in part of my question was related to your views on the Noahic Flood. Uh, but uh, could you give me your explanation of the fossil record and its existence? Uh, for instance, the Cambrian explosion, as an example. Well, what you see in the fossil record, and I'm going to include with a fossil record not just the bones, but also the isotope evidence of uh, life here on planet Earth is that for the first three billion years, it's only unicellular life forms and colonies of unicellular life forms. And Australia is where we got some of the most dramatic evidence uh, for those events. Uh, but 543 million years ago, you go from bacterial life to virtually every kind of conceivable animal body plant. It happens all at once. Uh, particularly in the Chinese site compared with the Canadian site, we see that even the most advanced animal phyla are there at the very beginning of the Cambrian explosion. And this is something we see in the history of life, is that it's punctuated by these mass extinction events followed by mass speciation events, just like you see in Psalm 104. But as we investigate the mass speciation events, we notice that we always get optimized ecological relationships immediately a Darwinian paradigm would predict that there would be a substantial passage of time from an extinction event to optimize ecologies. But the optimized ecologies show up immediately without a time delay every single time. Now, as to why God would use that approach, well, it's because the physics of the solar system is changing. You know, when I engage my biology peers, what I notice is they try to explain the fossil record as if there's no change going on in the sun, the earth, the moon, or the planets. And the truth is there's rather dramatic change going on. The sun today is 15% brighter than at the time of the origin of life. The earth is rotating five times more slowly. The radiation environment is changed by a factor of six. The radiation environment of the sun is changed by a factor of a million. So when you take that all into account, what you recognize is, in order to keep the Earth packed with as much life as possible, as diverse and as long as possible, it's crucial you have different life at different times. Why? Because, for example, you've got the sun getting brighter and brighter. Now, in order to keep life optimal and super abundant on the surface of the Earth, it's crucial that that life adjust the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere downward as the sun gets progressively brighter and brighter. And so what the creator does is he steps in and removes life that is not as efficient as pulling out greenhouse gases with life forms that are. That explains, for example, why vascular plants show up so late. Vascular plants hasten the erosion of silicate continental land masses by a factor of two to four times. And what that does is dramatically pull more greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So as the sun gets brighter, the temperature of the surface of the Earth remains ideal for life. And my peers in astronomy have actually calculated how frequently you would need a mass extinction event followed immediately by a mass speciation event in order to keep things ideal on the surface of the Earth. Uh, the answer is once every 25 to 27 million years. What does the fossil record tell us? Well, about once every 27 million years. So the two actually fit. But again, only a mind knows what life to take away and what new life to replace it. Uh, a mindless process would very quickly get out of sync and the planet becomes permanently sterile. So it's one of the more dramatic evidences that you need an intelligent uh, supernatural agency to ensure you got the right life on the planet at the right time throughout the entire history of life. Incidentally, that's going to be the subject of my next book. Um, there's a lot of debate about global warming and its repercussions. Global warming, global warming yes. and its repercussions. What are your views on that? Okay, global warming. At the back there, you'll see the book Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job. And what I point out there is in Genesis 1, 
It ends with a single sentence where God puts Adam and Eve and through them all of humanity in charge of the planet to manage its resources for the benefit of all life. It's just one sentence. Uh, the reason why Moses could get away with a single sentence is in the book of Job, which predates the content of uh, uh, Moses' books by about five or 600 years. Job had already explained how to take care of the planet for the benefit of all life. Job 37, 38, and 39 is God's creation care manual. But the main theme of that manual is that when we humans face a crisis in managing the planet for the benefit of all life, God already has designed the earth and its life. So when we face that kind of a crisis, he's provided a solution that's optimally ethical and at the same time optimally economic. Now, what's making the global warming issue so controversial is you've got one group of politicians saying, we need to make draconian economic sacrifices in order to make sure the planet doesn't get too warm. And you've got another set of politicians saying, wait a minute, that those draconian economic sacrifices are gonna cause great suffering. And uh, we need to do what's economically beneficial. And so they begin to say, maybe this global warming isn't what people claim it is. It's politically charged. But what if we can provide solutions that are optimally ethical and at the same time boost the economy? And so what I described, number one, in terms of global warming, uh, I can tell you there's no doubt that the planet is warming. And it's warmed many times in the past. Our planet goes through warming and cooling cycles. The real debate amongst us scientists, how much of this warming is the fault of human civilization and how much of it is the fault of natural cycles that our planet goes through? And unfortunately, the answer is not very uh, unambiguous. The human input is somewhere between 20 and 80% of the total. So we've got really big error bars on who's at fault here. But there's no doubt that global warming is happening. And there's no doubt that if it continues, it's going to put a real crimp on human civilization. Um, and by the way, an ice age is inevitable no matter what we do. Uh, but there are things we can do uh, to put off the inevitable. And what I describe in Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job are three solutions that are actually in this 4,000-year-old book that allow us to do something that will cool the planet and at the same time dramatically boost the economy of the world. Now, if you've got a solution like that, every politician is going to vote for it because everybody wins. But I use that as a general case uh, that for every ecological problem we face, there are those win-win solutions. Why? Because God designed the planet so that we humans would not be stuck with a choice uh, between ethics and economics. So one has to do with whales, one has to do with ostriches, and one has to do uh, with reversing the rainfall patterns that we have abused over the last several hundred years. But it's in the book at the back there. Yes, who's next? Um, Dr. Ross, I wonder if you would explain your understanding of um, the seven days of creation. Yeah. The Hebrew word used for day in Genesis 1 is the word yom. Notice, too, this debate over how long these creation days are is basically an English language debate. When I speak in other countries where they speak different languages, this isn't a big deal. It is in English. And the reason why is that you're taking Hebrew, which has only 3,000 words, if you don't count the names of cities and people, and translating it into a language that's got 4 million words. And so, for example, in English, we have over a dozen words for a long period of time. In biblical Hebrew, you only have one. It's the word yom, that's translated day. And because the Hebrew vocabulary is so tiny, Virtually every Hebrew noun has multiple literal definitions. So the word that you see for earth in Genesis 1, five different literal definitions. The word heaven, three different literal definitions. Which explains why Paul says in Corinthians, I was taken up to the third heaven, so you would know which heaven he was speaking about. The word yom translated day, four different literal definitions. 
It can mean part of the daylight hours, like from noon to 3 p.m. It can mean all of the daylight hours. It can mean a 24-hour rotation period or a long but finite period of time. And once again, yom is the only biblical Hebrew word uh, that can mean a long period of time. Now, the position we adopted reasons to believe is that Genesis 1 is declaring that God created in six consecutive long periods of time. And therefore, there's no contradiction between the book of nature and the book of scripture. And some of the reasons we take that position, you heard me tonight, there's no evening and morning for the seventh day. And three passages tell us we're still in the seventh day, which means the seventh day is a long period of time. Uh, a second obvious passage to go to is creation day six, where we're told that God created both the human male and the human female. But if you go to Genesis 2, God creates Adam first, and he's created outside the Garden of Eden. He watches the trees in the garden grow. Then God puts them in the garden, and he's told to tend the garden. Long enough, I believe, for him to realize there's got to be more to life than gardening. And then God has him name all the soulish animals. So he brought all these animals to uh, Adam and says, give each an appropriate name for how I've designed this creature to serve and please you. And having done all that, God looks down on Adam and notices he's lonely. It takes time to become lonely. And then God puts him to sleep, performs surgery on him. He sees his new creature. When he sees Eve, what do we see recorded in the original Hebrew coming out of his mouth? Hapa'am. It's a word used more than 20 times in the Old Testament, most commonly translated at long last. Therefore, the sixth day, like the seventh day, is a significant passage of time. And the grammatical structure would tell you all the days uh, would be, therefore, long periods of time. And by the way, the events previous to the creation day one uh, are indeterminate. There's nothing in the Hebrew uh, that would put a limit on how much time goes on between the creation of the universe uh, and the uh, beginning of creation day one. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, the, the speed of light and um, the, the origins of the universe from the singularity through to now, I think. Isn't it um, understood to be about 17 billion years or something, uh, the universe being around about that old? And I think I remember reading about 20 years ago something about a theory that the speed of light could change. Right. But it sounds, from what you've been saying, that that's, um, that's not biblical. So could you just comment on... Right. Yeah, yeah the age of the universe is about 13.8 billion years. And it's right here in Australia that a gentleman by the name of Trevor Norman came up with the idea that maybe uh, the universe is only thousands of years old. And the way he speculated was, well, what if the velocity of light per atom uh, were a million times faster than it is today? Then the light from distant stars and galaxies, which is a huge problem for the young Earth paradigm, could get here quickly rather than slowly. Well, we have measurements in astronomy that tell us the velocity of light is the same at distant galaxies as it is here on the Earth. And it's the same to like 13 places the decimal. So it's very precisely determined. I mean, there's certain spectral lines uh, that split, and the degree of splitting tells you the velocity of light. And we see the same degree of splitting everywhere we look in the universe. But uh, I found that no matter where I speak, all audiences know the equation E equals mc squared. Okay, C is the velocity of light, and E is energy. So if indeed Trevor Norman is right, and the velocity of light was a million times faster for Adam than it is for us today, so that light could get here that much faster, that would make the heat output of the sun a trillion times hotter. If it was a trillion times hotter, Adam would have been incinerated, along with the rest of planet Earth. And clearly that didn't happen. And bottom line, it's part of what we astronomers call the anthropic principle, that the velocity of light has a fine-tuned velocity to make life possible. Change it, even in the very slightest, at any time in the history of the universe, it rules out the possible existence of life. So the fact that you're sitting there 
proves there's never been a change in the velocity of light. And it comports well with the Bible, which says in Jeremiah 33, 25, the laws that govern the heavens and the earth don't change. The velocity of light is one of those laws and constants. It doesn't change. Go to people that haven't had a question yet over here. I remember learning in science. I remember learning in science about carbon dating and how um, reliable it was. Do you have any comment on um, its reliability? Yes, and uh, you'll see a lot more in my book, A Matter of Days. There's a whole chapter there on radiometric dating, and you actually see an article on our website that goes into it in some depth. And uh, in physics and astronomy, we have a, a whole range of radiometric tools. And uh, the thing we're needing to communicate to lay people is every radiometric tool has its range where it works and a much larger range where it doesn't. And the rule of thumb is you have to be within a factor of six of the half-life. Carbon-14, half of it decays over 5,715 years. So you can multiply that by six and divide by six. That's its range of applicability. So, for example, if you want to date a book that was published 10 years ago, carbon-14 dating is useless. It's too young. And if you're trying to date something that is 50,000 years old, that, again, is too old. But it's wonderful for dating Bible manuscripts that date to be 2,000 years old. So, for example, we've been able to accurately establish the dates of some manuscripts to plus or minus nine-month precision. And it's because you're close to the half-life. The other limitation of carbon-14, it dates how long something's been dead. So it's useless for dating a rock, but it's ideal for dating, say, a papyrus scroll, because a papyrus at one time was living tissue. So you're basically determining how long uh, that papyrus has been in a dead state. So that's where carbon-14 works, and uh, it can be calibrated back in time, because some people have speculated maybe the decay rate changed. Well, you can look in deep ice cores in Antarctica, for example, and in the annual layers, you'll see carbon-14. And so you can actually measure the rate of decay, decay uh, for the past 800,000 years by looking at the Dome C ice core. And uh, we do, by the way, see very tiny variations in carbon-14 half-lives. Why? Because nitrogen uh, decays, nitrogen-15 decays into carbon-14 through the agency of cosmic rays. Well, the cosmic ray bath is not constant. Cosmic rays come from supernova eruptions. So every time you've got a supernova eruption in the galaxy, it disturbs the carbon-14 decay rate, but only by a tiny amount, usually by about 1%. That's all we see. So typically, that doesn't make a lot of difference in uh, the calculation of the date. And if you're dating the Earth, you're going to want to use things like uranium dating and thorium dating. So, for example, uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.4 billion years. So it's ideal for dating uh, the birth of the Earth, because the Earth's uh, date is 4.57 billion. So you're right on, almost bang on the half-life. And likewise, thorium, with a decay rate of 14 billion years, uh, is also a useful tool. Um, what's been the reaction to your um, solutions um, in, the, in your book for uh, glo the global warming? For, for what? Global warming, you oh. said you had. Yeah, well, the book has only been out for a year and a half, but uh, we've gotten a very good reception, particularly from secular scientists, because they've been under a lot of pressure uh, to deny global warming. And it's like, okay, if we can take the economic issue out of it, then this is something that people can rationally look at uh, without bias. So, yeah, we've gotten a very good reaction. And it's actually leading to some interesting discussions, too, because if you look at the ice core data, you basically see a 100,000-year cycle of warming and cooling. And it looks like this. The temperature will spike up from an ice age, hit a peak that's about uh, 3 degrees centigrade warmer than where we are right now. But when it hits that peak, 
you get a rapid drop in temperature and you get an ice age. And it's such that the ice age typically lasts 90,000 years and you get a 10,000 year warm interglacial. But if we look at all the previous ice ages, the warm interglacial has looked like this. We're living in the only warm interglacial where the temperature spiked up, leveled off for 9,000 years at three degrees below the maximum level, and has stayed there. And because of that, we've been able to launch and sustain global high technology civilization. It's the ideal temperature, but in the past million years, in fact, in the past four million years, we've never seen what we call this warm spring, where it stops just short of the maximum and stays there for an extended period of time. And my colleagues are trying to figure out why. We don't know the answer, but it's, this is the only time in the history of the Earth that we can see that there's been what we call this long, steady uh, springtime uh, condition uh, for the Earth. But one thing is, it's exactly what you need uh, to explain civilization. Dr. Ross, I think the question too was, have any of your solutions been accepted in the scientific community? So pushing into the solutions. Oh, well, the solutions we recommend in the book are, for example, it'd be a really good idea to shrink the Sahara Desert to one-tenth of what it, what it is now. During the days of the Roman Empire, the Sahara Desert was only 10% of its size. And uh, we know how it got that big, and we know how to reverse it. And if we were to do that, uh, there would be a big food supply in Africa that Africa currently doesn't have. It would provide an economic source of income for those nations, and it would soak up huge quantities of greenhouse gases. So it's an example of a win, win, win. And how have my colleagues who are not Christians looked at that? It's a no-brainer. Let's do it. Although they think my idea might be a little bit radical, because I basically said, if we're going to motivate the sub-Saharan African peoples to work with us to replant the Sahara Desert, we're going to have to give them all the petroleum they want free of charge. And rather, they would have them pay for that petroleum rather than get it free of charge. But my whole point is, even if you've got to give it to them free of charge, it's worth doing. And if we don't give them some free fuel, they're going to keep stripping the land of grasses in order to have cooking fuel. We need to provide them. Uh, with their, a cooking fuel resource that's going to be cheaper and more convenient than what they're already uh, using. Because that's what's causing the Sahara Desert to get bigger. And frankly, I think the shrinking of the Gobi Desert might come first. That's four times bigger than it was 2,000 years ago. And the reason why I think that might come first is that the Gobi Desert a few years ago invaded the suburbs of Beijing. And so it's gotten the attention of the Communist Party leaders there that uh, this is a serious problem. And uh, they may have more motivation to do something about it. We'll see. Uh, just on the uh, fossils, uh, I've read lately that there's been some soft tissue found within fossil uh, yes. remnants. Can you explain uh, your view of that? Yes. Um, you know, there's been some debate that uh, soft tissue can't be preserved for long periods of time. Uh, what preserves soft tissue for long periods of time is if the creature is buried where you cut off all contact of bacteria and oxygen. If you've got oxygen and bacteria, it will decay. But if you don't have oxygen and bacteria, even though it's soft tissue, even though you've got blood vessels there, it will be perfectly preserved. And you see this, for example, in a lot of fossils that are as much as one, two, three hundred million years old. Uh, but it only happens where you've got a complete sealing off of oxygen and bacteria. And how often does that happen? Less than one-tenth of a percent of the, the fossil finds we have uh, have that degree of uh, protection from exposure to oxygen and, uh, and bacteria. You know, some modern-day examples of that are caves uh, where you get, say, a wolf that falls into the cave and lands on the floor. And uh, certain caves have a very low rate of uh, oxygen and bacteria. And what you notice is you get a perfect mummification of that creature. The tissue doesn't decay. Uh, so 
you know, even in real time, uh, we can observe that phenomena taking place. Uh, but in the case of uh, dinosaur soft tissue, it's an immediate cutting off of all oxygen and bacteria. We're getting close to the end, possibly one more. Huge fan. Um, one more question just regarding um, how, um, like I was brought up to believe like the 6,000, 10,000 year old and um, I was very confused by it. So when you came, when you came across and I really visualised it and I understand it, but obviously they, they got that six to 10,000 years from the genealogies in Deuteronomy and you know, Jesus and stuff. Right. So how does that fit? Okay, the genealogies. Yeah, that too is covered in the Navigating Genesis book, but if you really want to get the detailed scoop on it, the Hebrew scholar uh, Walt Kaiser has done probably the most extensive biblical research on the genealogies. And I was actually involved with him in a couple of uh, TV programs on this. And uh, what he and other Bible scholars point out is that every genealogy in the Bible uh, has missing names. No genealogy is exhaustive. And for example, you notice in Genesis 5 and 11, there is no totaling up of the years. Uh, and you know, in Hebrew, the word ob that's translated father can also mean grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather. Likewise, ben, the word son, uh, can mean grandson, great-great-grandson, etc. So again, the Hebrew vocabulary has a small size. And so a single word covers all these possibilities. Why do you have it in the Bible? Well, what Walt Kaiser and others would point out is every genealogy has got a redemptive message in it. So for example, some genealogies will choose to highlight the women as opposed to the men making the point that redemption is not just for men, it's for women too. And other genealogies will highlight the Gentiles as opposed to the Jews, making the point again, the gospel is for both Jews and Gentiles. And also in particularly the Old Testament genealogies, uh, they like regular patterns. So, and you actually see this in one of the New Testament genealogies where it records the genealogy from Jesus back to Adam and it puts it in three sets of 14 generations. Well, if you compare it with the uh, genealogies and chronicles, it's clear that they're giving you that what they consider to be the 14 key people in each segment. And what you see in Genesis 5 and 11 is that each genealogy has 10 names. And so it's kind of giving you the 10 key figures for the theological point that's being made in those early chapters of Genesis. And so, you know, I remember talking to my sons about the genealogies. They said, what could be more boring than all these list of begats? I said, wait a minute, this is in the Bible for a reason. It's not just a list of names. Let's actually look at what it says around the genealogy to see the theology that's being communicated there uh, in the genealogy. But for example, we see in Luke 3, 11 names uh, for the Genesis 5 genealogy. So that by itself establishes uh, that there are names that are left out. And as I said, if you compare the different genealogies, each one leaves out different names. But really what you got going on in Genesis 5, for example, it mentions those individuals that are in the patriarchal line that lead to Jesus. And these are the individuals that live a long time, except for Enoch, who did not die. God took him while he was still alive. Even so, he lived more than 300 years. But notice what it says in Genesis 6, where it talks about the wickedness of the pre-flood peoples. And what you see in Genesis 4, where it talks about Cain being a murderer and how his ancestor murdered seven people. And so the point there is, these are the exceptions that lived to be eight or 900 years of age. The vast majority of people were being killed by their fellow man. In fact, you'll see in the, the Navigating Genesis book, we actually calculate for you what the murder rate was in the days before the flood. It was over 95%. 95% of all people that were born were ending their life by being killed by their fellow man. 
In fact, we argue that the average lifespan in the human species today is longer than the average lifespan in the days before the flood. Yes, you got Methuselah living to be 967 years. He's the exception. The norm is people being killed in their 20s and 30s because of the wickedness of their fellow man. And if God hadn't intervened with a flood, humanity would have gone extinct. Humanity was on the verge of extinction in the days before the flood. And so the flood in that context is an act of mercy by the creator to save the human species from self-extinction. Maybe the last question of the night would be for our Sydney friend over here. Oh, thank you. Uh, Hugh, uh, this is something I've uh, wondered about. I know I've, on your podcast you guys have touched on it. Um, uh, that whole universe from nothing, the quantum bubble, I mean, you know, they're saying that quantum theory can say that something can come from nothing. I mean, that to me sounds ridiculous, but maybe you can sort of elaborate what they it's mean. It's not that ridiculous when you see these physicists and astronomers talking about something coming from nothing. I mean, I gave a sermon in our church on everything you want to know about nothing and basically talked about how in physics we have nine different definitions of nothing. And every one of those definitions is something. And so when Lawrence Krauss talks about the universe coming from nothing, you need to ask him, what kind of nothing are you talking about? <laughs> so for example, he makes a big deal that you can get matter out of nothing. Well, it's not really matter out of nothing. It's matter being created out of the space-time quantum fluctuations. And so, for example, we have experiments in particle physics labs that tell us that the quantum space-time fluctuations in the space fabric of the universe can actually produce virtual particles. And Lawrence Krauss says, well, that's how the universe came about. Well, the space-time theorems tell us that the beginning of the universe is the beginning of space and time. If you've got no space and time, you've got no quantum space-time fluctuations. And so, in that sense, his creation out of nothing is a creation out of something. And the other fatal flaw in his suggestion that it's just like virtual particles, okay, you can get virtual particles being produced out of, quote, nothing, that is, space-time quantum fluctuations, with one proviso. It must return to the quantum space-time foam before any experimenter can, quote, keep the virtual particle. That's why we call it virtual particles. You can't keep the particles. They go back into this quantum space-time foam so quickly you can't capture the particle. Now, if you're trying to use virtual particle production as an analogy for how the universe came about, we can calculate through quantum mechanics the snapback time, how quickly the universe would have to return to the quantum space-time uh, fluctuations. It would have to return in less than 10 to the minus 120 seconds. So no matter what kind of creation model you have, I think we'd all agree the universe is older than 10 to the minus 120 seconds. Therefore, that's not how the universe came about. Now, in Lawrence Krauss's book, he appeals to three other kinds of nothing to try to make the universe. But all of them are just like the virtual particle example. And if you want to see uh, a critique of his book, uh, I've got a 16-page review of his book up on our website. Um, I forget the title of it. I think it's everything, well, is nothing really nothing or something like that. But if you put Lawrence Krauss's name in, it'll pop right up on our search engine. All right, did everybody get all of that? I mean, just repeat it back for me straight away. That'd be great. I mean, my head's exploding and that's been my last 24 hours, so uh, some sympathy for me. But uh, seriously, I think uh, genuinely all through the night there, there's been some real uh, nuggets that all of us at any different level can take away, no doubt about it. Uh, the, the whole point to not getting it all is uh, the books and uh, these books, great books, are all available at the back. There's videos as well. Uh, that's a great way to be able to just resource yourself and really encourage you in that regard. All